Gab injuries, Australia started filling the gap and telling the stories of the people that couldn't get compensation. So essentially, we're the safety experiment for COVID vaccines. And the extraordinary thing here is world energy has kept going up. The right to protest is essential, fundamental, and in my view, sacred. However, that doesn't automatically mean that we can do absolutely anything we want in the name of protest and get away with it. We need to understand what protest is and isn't and apply those definitions consistently to everyone, whether we like what they're protesting about or not. In the US, we've seen riots with buildings being torched and shops being looted, being described as mostly peaceful. A paramilitary takeover of a section of downtown Seattle was described as a protest, while a bunch of unarmed people wandering, confused, around the Capitol building that the police had let them into was described as an insurrection. Just look at those dangerous selfie sticks. And some of the biggest protests in US history, the Tea Party movement, which famously left their protest sites cleaner than they were when they arrived, was described as a fascist rebellion. Clearly, consistency in defining what protest is, is something the dinosaur media and governments don't have. We have similar problems here in Australia. Not only did the media not accurately report numbers during the anti-lockdown protests, but they also pretended that peaceful protests against lockdowns were actually violent riots and characterised protesters as dangerous. And fast forward into the present, we now have the Just Stop Oil protesters who are deliberately obstructing public and private property and engaging in malicious publicity stunts as part of their protests. It's all a bit of a mess, and it's hard to know where the protesting ends and the basic criminal behaviour begins. In response to these Just Stop Oil obstructions, for example, we're seeing new laws being passed in places like South Australia, creating, frankly, absurd penalties for obstructing people during protests. And whilst some people support these laws, I'm not so sure. I'd rather see the free market of ideas figure out how to deal with obstructive protesters rather than top-down government control in the form of new penalties and laws, penalties that I know from personal experience will be abused. So it's with some pleasure that I've been watching a wave of pushback against Just Stop Oil. Some of it is pretty freaking hilarious. Uh, yes, there is the usual and expected scenes of protesters being dragged off streets. No, I don't approve of violence. But if you're going to deliberately make people angry, don't be too surprised when they get angry. But recently, some people have been getting quite a lot more clever than these scenes that we're seeing here. And I have to admit that I am enjoying that show. A video that you absolutely must watch is a video from a YouTube account called Josh and Archie. I'll put the description in the, the, the link in the description of the video. Josh and Archie actually agree with Just Stop Oil, with their objectives, but in their own words, they believe that they're going about it the wrong way, something that I think 99% of people would agree on. But what to do about it? Well, I'll show you a few clips from their video because, well, it's just beautiful to watch. It turns out they meet at Pret, where they drink coffee flown in from Peru in single-use cups. We discovered that before ruining everyone's day, the privately educated protesters stand in a circle and teach one another how to breathe. Watched by the police, the group split up across London to cause maximum disruption. They march, get moved off the road by the cops, before marching again and getting moved off pausing for some free organic and again flown in coffee before marching again, getting moved off, heading to a secret HQ for a complimentary lunch, before marching again until the fuzz have had enough and they end up in handcuffs. I love you all! And so far this has achieved nothing more than a crackdown on everyone's right to protest. Now we knew how they worked, we needed a way of stopping them. What up, Roy? We can't use like an object though, because they are able to push through an object that aren't able to push so through people. Basically they can't, it's not illegal to assault a piece of rope or a peg. It is illegal to assault us, so we're using our bodies, mm. our bodies our choice. Archie decided we needed some merch. This is our new slogan. Just stop pissing everyone off. This is it, we, we're ready to go and uh, just, just stop, stop pissing just everyone off. Them. All the way around, all the way around, guys. Interlock arms. Lock, lock, lock. That's just a few selected clips from the hilarious 10 minute video that's been watched half a million times in a few days. The link is in the description, and I highly recommend that you take the time to watch it. I guarantee it'll put a smile on your face. 
The video actually doesn't stop with them encircling the Just Stop Oil protesters. They go on to pull off another tactic involving helium balloons and very loud alarms. You'll have to watch their video to see what they did. But I wanted to show you that little clip, that little edited bit of their work so that you can see how it's done right, how the free market of ideas can solve even these sorts of problems better than governments can. Adding more draconian laws and harsher penalties for protesting is going to backfire. And these laws will someday be abused by petty wannabe tyrants, just like what we've seen in Victoria and Western Australia already. But there's plenty of free market ways of dealing with idiots like Just Stop Oil. There's never very many of them, so things like encircling them with a the human chain is, well, honestly, it's genius. And not only does it work, but it really highlights how small and how fringe they are. If Just Stop Oil can be outnumbered instantly by a Just Stop, Just Stop Oil protest, then really, it kind of says everything, doesn't it? For as long as they're blocking streets and getting arrested, they feel like they're achieving something. Those being arrested feel like heroes. It's a perfect example of government not being the right tool to fix the problem. But when they can be stopped by a handful of people standing in the sun for a half day, well, that's just humiliating for them, isn't it? And that's the point. The free market, this time in the form of comedians Josh and Archie, is providing better and far cheaper ways of dealing with Just Stop Oil than the government could ever hope for. I hope this is the start of something really beautiful, with people getting clever about how they deal with idiot protesters who deliberately block streets and infrastructure. And I hope it's the end of new laws aimed at cracking down on protest. There is a wrong way to protest and raise awareness of a cause you believe in, but there is also a right way. And our first news item coming up in a moment is a perfect example of someone raising awareness the right way. Let's get to the news. Well, last week we introduced you to Matthew Lawson. He's someone well known to many of you, no doubt. And we talked about the fact that he's actually walking. Yes, that's with his feet, walking from Melbourne to Brisbane, raising awareness for Jab Injuries Australia. Well, I have some wonderful news. He's going incredibly well and he's actually crossed into New South Wales. Uh, Matt Lawson joins us now. Matt, where exactly are you today? Hey, it's Ofa. Yeah, I crossed the border late yesterday. Um, it's incredible. I've done another 23K, 23K today, so I'm up in Finlay. Yeah, wow. Now, you were getting some good support from people. You had a support vehicle coming with you and uh, and some people stopping by the side of the road uh, helping you out. I've been on your Facebook page. I see there are people taking photos of you as they drive past. So obviously you're, you're a bit of an occasional celebrity out there in the, in the wilderness on the side of these, these very remote roads. Uh, what's the reception been like as you've gone from town to town? The reception's been amazing. I... Uh when I crossed the border last night, I had about 25 people there. It oh, doesn't wow. sound like much, but it was half of half of Token Wall. <laughs> um, funnily enough, they're all talking about the last time you were up here, Tofi. You're, you're the real celebrity <laughs> up here. But, um, no, the support's been, support's been great. Look, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Now, actually, uh, just uh, just a minute ago, I was chatting with Rebecca Barnett, who actually writes and interviews uh, victims of jab injuries for Jab in- Injuries Australia over in, in Western Australia. For those that aren't familiar with Jab Injuries yep. Australia, what is it that, that they do and, and why, why does it matter? Why are you raising awareness and raising support for them? Yeah, so Jab Injuries Australia um, popped up, of course, when people started getting COVID jabs and... Uh, obviously were subsequently injured. Um, the compensation schemes that the government are running are very, very hard. <laughs> That's all right, mate. <laughs> some, fi- some finger trouble uh, there. Carry on. Yeah. The compensation schemes that the government are running are very hard, complicated um, forms for people to fill out. So yeah. Jab Injuries Australia started filling the gap and telling the stories of the people that couldn't get compensation, the people that were suffering, mm. um, they quickly got, you know, about 100,000 followers on Instagram. Mm. But what we're trying to do is get this to crack into mainstream media. Yeah. Now, I've been lucky enough over the last few days to have some really great independent newspapers mm-hmm. um, throughout this region pick up the story, which has been fa- fantastic. I mean, you helped me as well get a guy on board. Sure. Um, it's sort of going along the Bush Telegraph and people are finding out I've got now accommodation pretty much all the way up to Darbo, but we're also getting into all the newspapers and that's what we want to do. Yeah, brilliant. 
Brilliant. Look, I, I, I tip my hat to you, Matt. This is this is an incredible undertaking. And when you start out on something like this, you have no idea whether you're going to get support, whether it's going to work, what you're actually going to achieve, but you were still willing to put your life on hold and, and take that risk and, and pay that price regardless. I do really hope that this just gathers an enormous amount of momentum for you. You're going all the way to Brisbane. What would you call a success? What are you hoping to be able to say you've accomplished by the time you get there? In all honesty, for me, um, I, I've been asked that a few times. For me, if we even wake up or have, you know, 5, 10, 15, 25 people mm. start talking, start having conversations, and, and for me, it's the small conversations. I don't, I don't like sure. the big fanfare in the towns and stuff because we we have a bit of an echo chamber. We want to get outside that. So it's the small conversations in the uh, IGAs. It's the small conversations in the chemists. And yeah. if you can send, you know, 5, 10, 15 people away a day having conversations back at their dinner table about jab injuries and looking at the pages, mm. then you can maybe start a bit of a groundswell where it goes around everywhere. So it's really just about awareness. Um, and I like walking, so, yeah, a bit of a stroll. <laughs> I like walking, he says, as he sets out to walk a couple of thousand k's. Well, Matt, if that's your goal, I think you, you've probably already smashed that out of the park. I think you've set a lot of tongues wagging. Uh, and w- what I'm enjoying about it is it, it's actually given me, and, and this is going to sound weird, it's given me a very easy way to introduce the subject, uh, especially as I live up on the Murray River and uh, you, you cross the Murray not quite where I am, but uh, I can sort of chat to people and go, oh, did you know there's a, there's a bloke walking from Melbourne to Brisbane right now? He's just crossed the Murray River. And they go, what? Why? And now they've asked me the question and I get to tell them why. So it's I think what you've done is brilliant. I think it's it's working brilliantly. I do have one last question for you before I let you go. Uh, when you get to Brisbane, have you remembered to buy a flight home or are you going to have to walk? <laughs> uh, I'm hoping my support team won't be too sick of me and they can uh, win me a lift home. Um, as everything, I just do it by the seat of my pants. But yeah, hopefully I can get a bit of a lift home. Well, Matt Lawson, thank you for joining us once again. I wish you Godspeed. Look after your feet. Look after the uh, the sunburn as well. And we'll catch up with you a few more times again as this journey progresses. Thanks. Love you, brother. Everyone Cheers. get onto the Aussie wire. Peace. Time is running out to get your tickets for the Church and State Conference in Perth. I'll be there on the 4th and 5th of August. Get your tickets via the link in the description below. Well, every now and again, something happens that really catches you off guard, like a government actually appearing to be honest. And something as crazy as that actually happened recently when the West Australian government released some information, some data around vaccine adverse reactions. It was kind of hard to believe that it was actually real to start with. And it was only once I read an excellent blog post by a journalist by the name of Rebecca Barnett that it began to sink in for me that this data was actually real. It was actually authoritative. authoritative, And we were looking at what I think is going to prove to be a watershed moment as history looks back on the consequences of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. I wanted to talk to the author of that blog post myself. Rebecca Barnett joins me right now here on the Aussie Wire. Rebecca, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Now, well, uh, firstly, um, congratulations. You are a trained journalist. It shows in your work. You've, you've got an outstanding writing style. I've become a subscriber and a bit of a fan of your Substack. We'll put the link to that in the description of this video. But this particular blog post of yours drew attention to something really quite astonishing. Can you, can you, can you brief us what's contained in this, this data from the West Australian government? Sure. So Western Australia is completely unique in the world. Uh, there are very few regions that ha- that were almost completely vaccinated before we had any COVID. Mm. We shut our borders. I mean, Australia shut its borders, but also Western Australia, we we're incredibly isolated. And so we were able to actually just hermit off for several years and we became known as the hermit kingdom. <laughs> so essentially, we have the safety experiment for COVID vaccines because our data is unconfounded by COVID infection. So what we find in 2021 is that vaccine adverse event reporting increased by in the rate at 24 times the normal rate of adverse event reporting for vaccines. Mm. So that means that COVID vaccines generated 24 times more, not in raw number, but in rate per 100,000 uh, doses administered, mm. more reports than 
all the other vaccines combined for 2021. It's quite an astonishing thing. And anyone that wants to see these graphs in more detail can go to your Substack and to your blog and and see them there. That's where I've got these from. But this is data directly out of a report released by the West Australian government. There's a couple of things that that I find really quite astonishing here. Uh, Firstly, looking at this graph, you can see that that gradual sort of annual heartbeat of when the the, the flu vaccines roll out. Uh, More vaccines are being administered, obviously, around that sort of April, May time. We see an uptick in adverse reactions. That's reasonably well expected. Um, can you uh, just looking at the graph with the naked eye? I'm just trying to pick where does the COVID nineteen rollout start? It's not obvious to me. Can well, you just just help I me know. see that? <laughs> Look, I went back and I checked the data, and it's actually where the big red arrow is. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, otherwise it was just it was just too subtle. I would have missed it without that big red arrow. <laughs> um, but your, the note that you've got there uh, points out that the the COVID nineteen vaccine rollout started on the 22nd of that month, so almost at the end of that month, and we just see a little teeny tiny uptick in that particular mm-hmm. month. It's within the boundaries that we've seen from prior months with the the, the flu rollouts, the, the flu vaccine yeah. rollouts. And then all of a sudden from the following month, it, it, it just goes insane. It, it, it We hear a lot of people telling us, I'm sorry, I, I just find this even hard to talk about because it just boggles my mind. A lot of people are trying to tell us there's nothing wrong with the COVID-19 vaccines. And, and I'll bring up this other graph here. This here is the smoking gun for me, Rebecca. Can you just talk people through who may not be used to reading graphs or reading statistics or understanding what this is talking about? Can you just talk us through what is this graph that you've lifted, as I understand it, directly from that West Australian government report? What is this telling us? So this is telling us that um, in a normal year, they're getting to that normal safety reporting systems, uh, about 200 uh, adverse event reports following vaccination in a normal year mm. um, and that the rate per 100,000 doses, and it's the rate that's important because obviously there were a lot more doses of COVID vaccine given than Absolutely. any other vaccination in any other given year. And that's what people often highlight when we uh, pick up on the fact that there's an increase in adverse event reporting. There are two things that people want to bring up. One is yes, but more doses were given. And so that's that's true. And what this table that you've pulled up is showing is actually the rate of adverse events reported per 100,000 doses. So this this accounts for the increase in number. Mm -hmm. So you can see here, just under 10,500 adverse events were reported in that year for COVID-19 vaccines specifically, compared to 200 adverse events reported for all the other vaccines combined in mm. Western Australia. Mm. So that's that's point one. Point two is people um, will say, yes, but a report isn't, pr- you know, correlation is not causation. You can't prove that these things were caused by, by the vaccine. And that is correct, although there's two counters to that. One is that um, we're comparing apples for apples here. So we were comparing reports for reports. Mm-hmm. So the uh, intention behind surveillance systems like these is typically, it's generally agreed that the intention is to uh, show signals that then need further, that then indicate there needs to be further research. Mm. So this is showing a signal that 24 times the normal number of people are experiencing um, something that they perceive to be an adverse event following a vaccination. Um, and that that then warrants further investigation. Mm. Um, the other thing I would say is that further on in this report, there actually are quite a few sections where the um, adverse events have been confirmed by the Vaccine Safety Clinic in mm. Western Australia. Mm-hmm. So it's not correct to say that all of these reports have not been confirmed to be causally linked uh, because many of them actually have. There's a, there's a third objection that I hear often and I find very distasteful, if I'm quite honest, because, of, well, for reasons that I'll, I'll go, get to in a second. But people say, oh, this is because there was such a big push for people to report adverse reactions. Uh, it's just because you know, we're, we're reporting the adverse reactions this time, so it looks a lot worse than the other vaccines. But what that is is a tacit admission that, that the reactions to the other vaccines must be a lot higher. I mean, they have to pick their poison. Either yeah. the, 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 the reactions to the other vaccines are being underreported um, or or this vaccine is creating more adverse reactions. It's it's kind of pick your poison one or the other. Yeah, it's also an incomplete view. It's true to say that there is some academic literature to suggest that um, an increased publicity around a reporting system may lead to more reports, mm. and the report does uh, reference one of those papers. Mm-hmm. So 
fair fair play. Um, but if I were writing an academic paper on this, I would not get a pass if I did if that was my full literature review. Sure. Because if you were to do a full literature review, you would also have to reference the literature on underreporting, uh, mm. which the I mean the literature finds that anywhere between uh, an underreporting factor of anywhere between ten to a hundred. Fold. So being very conservative, we might say a tenfold underreporting factor. Now, how much has the increased publicity around um, adverse events for COVID vaccines offset mm. the re- underreporting factor? Don't know. I haven't actually seen anyone attempt to answer that question and mm. they haven't attempted to answer it in this report. Well, as you say, the purpose of collecting and, and having a reporting system is to detect a signal. Uh, but Rebecca, clearly there is no signal to be detected here. I, I don't see any signal at all. Carry on business as usual. I, yeah, I need to point out too, when you say perhaps, you know, if we are to say, okay, perhaps a, um increase in publicity has increased the number of reports. Mm. Well, we need to also offset that against um, just what happened in in the real world. So October, I believe, is the highest month for adverse events reports on that Let me get back there. Now, what happened at the end of October in Western Australia was we had a hospital crisis. We, um, our premier went on the news, I think it was the 31st of October, right at the end of the month, to say, our hospitals are in trouble. We um, we are just overwhelmed. Mm. And he said uh, in that press conference, we think it might be a delayed reaction to COVID. Now, we had, uh, I can't remember how many it was that month. I think it was 16 COVID cases that month in Western Australia because we were having snap lockdowns. Every yeah, time there every was time. a community case, mm-hmm. our whole state would go into a lockdown mm-hmm. for three days or five days. So yeah. we did not have COVID circulating in the community. When we did have COVID cases, it was generally quarantine um, from c- cases from travellers coming back in. So 16 cases that month. Um, and we had a hospital crisis, but what we did have was hundreds and hundreds of over a thousand uh, adverse event reports for mm. October, and fifty-seven percent of the adverse events reported in this document uh, fronted at hospital. They were either treated in ED or they were admitted to hospital. Mm. So we know that over half of the adverse events reported, you know, most likely. Uh, well, we know that 57% of the people who who reported adverse events had to go to hospital. Yeah, wow. Wow. I mean, well, and that puts a light of the claim that other people make that, oh, but most of these reports, most of these adverse reactions, it's very minor. Well, obviously, many of them are fully recovered from. But if from the report, 57% are actually going to hospital, then we know that a lot of those minor reactions are just simply not being captured in the data. They're just not bothering to lodge a report for, for minor reactions. This is is really capturing the, the, the reactions that are at the more serious end of the scale, is it not? Yeah, and we need to also remember that, yes, there was an increased publicity around um, adverse event reporting, but we also had a very um, hawkish uh, kind of medical censorship going on. So um, I do, I'm an interviewer for a group called Jab Injuries Australia, Mm. and in the interviews that I do with people who have documented um, vaccine injuries, uh, most people report that their doctors strongly denied any potential for there to be uh the for the vaccine to be causally linked yeah. um there was a very strong in western australia you were a pariah if you weren't vaccinated and even people who were vaccinated and were injured mm-hmm. were being labeled anti-vax and mm-hmm. anti-vax was like the worst possible thing you could be called at that time yeah so um you know again we need to offset any uh uptick in reporting due to public publicity with the um, very strong pressure to not report or not be seen as suggesting yeah. that your ailments might be linked to the vaccine and the yeah. doctors um that there were many reports uh through my interviews uh of, of doctors being very unwilling to make those reports on behalf of patients mm. 
That sadly is not uh, not unique to Western Australia, but certainly the overall circumstances of Western Australia were very unique. And uh, in the process, through great suffering uh, for many of the people of the great state of Western Australia, uh, you have provided us with this remarkable data set that um, hopefully will open a lot of eyes and, and bring a lot of people around when it comes to this particular subject. Rebecca Barnett, thank you so much for coming on the Aussie Why. The link to your Substack will be in the description of this video. I do highly recommend people check that out. And this certainly won't be the last time we'll be seeing you on the Aussie Why. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Australia's energy is more renewable than ever before. So say the statistics. But then again, it's very easy to lie with statistics. So there's a recent bombshell report that's come out that's been touted as wonderful news by the Green Lobby. But we have a slightly different perspective here, thanks to our science correspondent, Joanne Nova. Joe, thank you so much for joining us here on the Aussie Wire. Always a pleasure, Topher. And this huge report called the Statistical Review of World Energy has been put out by originally by BP since about 1961, and they mm. put it out every year in June, and it is it become a huge, long report, and they've even handed it over to a group called the Energy Institute. And just so you have the basis behind this, the Energy Institute marks their mission as being essentially to get everyone onto uh, the global transition to net zero. So they are as green as green gets, interpret mm. the statistics <laughs> through that light, uh, as good as they get. And the extraordinary thing here is world energy has kept going up. So we had a pandemic, things slowed down, but it has risen beyond that. I think we're now at 3% more energy being used by humans around the world. So these are global statistics. And 3% more than 2019. And, and yes, that graph, it's actually quite a glorious graph starting in 1910. So we're looking at 110 years there of human development mm. and what a miracle story it is. And it's all a fossil fuel revolution. You look at the enor enormous growth mm. in coal, oil and gas mm. and what it's done for the world. And just think about w the way our lives have changed since 1910. Goodness. And, you know, the fact that everyone's now got, well, everyone in our in rich countries has plug in, turn on the wall, electricity, heating, cooling, mm. all that kind of thing. And then you look at the entire renewables transition, which I coloured and combined in black at the top there mm. so it was visible. Mm -hmm. And that is all the solar, the wind, the geothermal, the tidal, the biofuel, all of it packed lot. together. And that's what we're looking at. In mm. other words, we've had so much propaganda about this green transition and it's almost nothing on top of the revolution we've already had. Now, this graph blew my mind and anyone that hasn't been to Joe Nova's blog, you need to do yourself a favour. I'll put the link to this exact story on your blog, Joe, into the show notes here because people need to spend some time poring over this. Number one, the correlation between energy consumption and quality of life is undeniable. I don't know anyone that really wants to debate that point. Increased energy availability to, to mankind has been a tremendous boon to our quality of life, our length of life life in, and, and in fact for the environment as well. As we've had hydrocarbon based fuel become available to us, we've started uh, having to you know, kill less whales for their blubber and various other things like that. We've begun to, we've begun to be able to be more efficient in so many other ways. But the, the story for right now that I want to bring out here, and Joe, you do this beautifully in your blog, so I'm sorry to be stealing your thunder and borrowing what you've said, but the story here is that even with this so-called increase in renewable energy being used, the amount of hydrocarbon energy being used is still going up. And Joe, that doesn't look like changing anytime soon, does it? Well, no, and I should point out in that graph it, that it, that's only to 2021. It doesn't have the latest year's statistics. Mm. And the reason for that is because for some strange reason, with all the funding that the Energy Institute has, mm. they didn't do this graph. They only did little slices of um, of graphs mm. of the changes in energy for the last year because that mm. looks so much better for renewables than looking at the big picture the way this has been done here. So, mm. gee whiz, if I had the kind of funding they had, I could have <laughs> added in the latest statistics on that, which show that world uh, energy is now 1% higher than the year before. And, uh, and so across the entire world, that's a fair bit more energy being used up. Mm, mm. And with that growth in energy being used, the scary thing is renewables, as they say, remember, this is coming from a green group, mm. the renewables, excluding hydro, met 84% of net energy demand growth in 2022, yeah. and I emphasise that because they are admitting mm. that the renewables themselves were not even covering 100% of the increase mm. in energy the world 
produced in 2022. So renewables were not even keeping up with the demand. So when we talk about net zero, it got a little bit further away last year than it was the year before. And to put this bizarre thing in perspective, the numbers we're talking about were enormous. In solar, mm. they estimate the amount of solar capacity grew 25% last year. I, I, these are monster mm. growths in mm. a single year, 25% more solar PV and 13% more wind. We are installing these damn things as fast as we can, and it isn't even keeping up with energy demand around the world. That's the bombshell that blew my mind. And when you when you start to combine this with other stories that we've talked about here and other things that we haven't, the, the revelation that these Siemens Gamisa massive wind turbines have a, a larger number of issues than what we were aware of, what even Siemens were aware of. Issues now where we're seeing increasing numbers of solar farms, of course, as they proliferate around the world, they start to get hit by more storms and hailstorms and things like this. We're beginning to understand the weaknesses in this technology, the vulnerabilities in this technology, and it can no longer be glossed over with a, a shiny glossy brochure. Is there going to be a moment where the world realizes that they've been conned? I remember talking to you, Joe, years and years ago, I believe it was 2013, mm. I think the first time we worked together. And we were both saying back then, within five years, the the the, the shades will fall off people's eyes and they'll realize and, and we'll be able to move on and leave this whole bit of nonsense behind us. Well, here we are 10 years later. And unfortunately, it just hasn't happened yet. It, it, it is starting to, I think, what we're seeing in Europe, we're seeing because of the Ukraine-Russia war, mm. the, the, remember when that broke out, people were saying, oh, this will be the big thing for renewables because mm. coal and oil have got so expensive. Mm. Well, despite that expense, the opposite happened. Mm. And we've got quite a few countries in Europe that are voting for more right-wing governments and those right-wing governments are talking about more nuclear. Poland's installing nuclear. Sweden, mm. as we talked about, is installing mm. nuclear. Italy has said they want more nuclear. Mm. So, uh, and France is still fighting for its nuclear. And when I say fighting for it, it, it has to convince the EU that nuclear is a low carbon, re, you know, equivalent to renewable. <laughs> and it's you such can't a joke. Make this stuff up. It has to do that. It <laughs> defies all forms of chemistry and physics uh. to say that. But, uh, you know, what we are seeing things, the, the energy costs have bitten and even mm. Germany with a semi-green traffic light government mm -hmm. is really struggling mm -hmm. because the people are going, wait, 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 this is just madness. Yeah. And they're talking about, you know, putting heat pumps in, reverse cycle heating it run by electricity mm. and telling everyone to get EVs, mm. which will need what? You know, mm. electricity. Amazing. And they're struggling to provide the electricity. And you kind of go, these these things are not going to meet up here in the middle in a happy way, guys. Yeah. And and so I think they are waking up to that in Europe and only through brutal, tough lessons and very cold winters. Mm. Well, thankfully, we're not subject to the same level of cold in our winters, but we do certainly get heat in summer. We're seeing increased unreliability across Australia, You know, even winter brownouts happening up in Queensland at, at, at the wrong times of year and uh, unreliability happening across the grid, not to mention incredible increases in energy costs. The current federal government was elected on a promise that they were going to bring down uh, energy prices. We've seen the exact opposite happen. How how much further do you think this can go in Australia before we see Australians begin to get a bit of European spine and start to put push back against this? Uh, look, and Tofa, th that depends a lot on our conversation, our national conversation. Mm. And so that's where I plead with everyone watching the video, please be active in sharing the message because mm. we know that when the grid gets expensive and when things start to fail, they will blame coal and they will blame old reactors and blah, 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 and they will not talk about the fact that people stop maintaining their coal plants, mm. which it can be maintained indefinitely, essentially, if you just keep fixing the parts yeah. before they fail. Yeah. And they're not putting that money into the maintenance and doing and treating those coal plants like what they deserve. You know, we're mm. talking about something that took a generation to pay off mm. and they're being wasted because the, the market the government has imposed on top of it is not a free market no. and that managed market is failing badly. And so it's driving these coal plants out of business and they are not the fault 
of the the problems we're getting, they're the only thing keeping it alive. So we will get more uh, blackouts and problems and we will get bigger electricity bills, mm. but we have to get the message across that this idea that solar and wind are cheap is just a, a very shallow kind of messaging. It's seductive, but mm. it's so not true. It's not at all true. Look, I, I'm going to put my tinfoil hat on for a second here and say that if you were a massive energy producer that had a mix of coal at one end and, and you know battery storage at the other end that could be dispatched on demand. Uh, with the current market, as you say, correctly pointing out, it's not a free market at all. With the current bid stack and the way that that's designed, I would be very tempted to have some uh, reliability issues with my coal at strategically timed moments so as to jack up the price of electricity and be able to profit much more greatly off all of my other sources of energy. One of the things people don't realize is that all energy providers are paid at the most expensive level for that particular moment in time. People don't understand this. They think, well, coal gets paid a certain amount and nuclear gets paid a certain amount and wind get pay gets paid a certain No, they all get paid the same. That, that amount changes. But in any given moment, they're paid the same based on the most expensive bid that is accepted. And strategically, just putting my tinfoil hat on, I'm not making any accusations, of course. But there might be a case for maximizing shareholder value, for example, by, oh, oops, unfortunately having an unreliable coal plant at a strategic moment to increase prices across the rest of my portfolio. Is that, um, is that a well, tinfoil yeah, hat moment that you share? In theory, Tofa, mm. uh, you could hypothetically say that those companies would be letting down their shareholders if they did not explore all the options for maximising profits. Mm -hmm. And those options for maximising profits include closing down coal stations, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps even sooner than might make sense in order to make the other parts of your entire portfolio more profitable. Mm. So, uh, you know, and now the government has set up a whole raft of agencies supposedly to stop you know, companies doing this sort of thing. Mm. But in the old days, we used to rely on the free market to do that, you know. The incentive being that if you had more expensive electricity, customers would just go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I say what we need in Australia more than anything is a return to a free market, less government intervention, less government agencies, because the agencies can't stop that kind of behaviour mm -hmm. when it is ultimately in the company's interest to reduce those cheap providers out of the yeah. system. Yeah. And to be clear, this is this is purely hypothetical and only made mm. possible because of this so-called market, the Australian energy market operators' so-called market that they operate with the bid stack. We're going to go into some really technical stuff on that in future episodes of the Aussie Wine News. But you know what, Joe, I think that's all we've got time for for this particular story on this particular day. Thank you so much once again for coming on the Aussie Wire. Thank you. That is it for the Aussie Wire today. If you'd like to support the Aussie Wire, you can do so by becoming an insider. The link is in this video's description. Insiders get giveaways. We're actually giving away a Good People Break Bad Laws hoodie today. It's too late for you to get into that draw, but all our insiders are automatically included in all our giveaways. So make sure to become an insider today so that you don't miss out on our giveaways and discounts and exclusive content in the future. We release new episodes of the Aussie Wire News Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4pm. You can catch up on past episodes and read our blog at theaussiewire.com. Follow all our socials at The Aussie Wire and make sure you've signed up to our email list so that we can keep in touch if we get cancelled. That's all for today. I'm Topher Field and this is The Aussie Wire. <laughs>